I like to think of three golden ages for the Giza necropolis. One, of course, is in the fourth dynasty when Khufu and his successors were building the pyramids and laying out the cemeteries. Another golden age is about 1900 to 1950, the era of the great scientific excavations. And that's what we'll explore briefly in this section. The third golden age is right now, of course, when these fantastic new technologies allow us to have access to Giza and many other archeological sites in ways that we could only dream about previously. So there are many places we could jump in and start to talk about the more responsible scientific approach to documenting antiquity. One of them might be Napoleon's invasion and the discovery of the Rosetta Stone and decipherment of hieroglyphs that came in 1822. But I'm going to jump a little bit later and start with the first large-scale expedition that went to Egypt and the Sudan since the decipherment of hieroglyphs. And that was led by the Prussian scientist Carl Richard Lepsius. Lepsius took a small army of scholars with him, and he had a nice modest goal, which was to document everything in Egypt and in the Sudan. And he basically did it. He went in the 1840s, and Giza was one of the first stops. They climbed the top of the Great Pyramid. They did the first numbering system for some of the Mastaba tombs. They even brought some of the objects back to Berlin afterwards. And you can see them now in the Berlin Museum. Here is a photograph of the gigantic multi-volume set that resulted from Lepsius's expedition. It's called Denkmäler aus Ägypten und Ethiopien, Monuments from Egypt and Ethiopia. They are gigantic. And in fact, in this photograph, I've circled a little bottle of nail polish just to show you how big they are. Try lifting one of these. It's good exercise. But they are spectacular volumes. They have drawings both in uh, line art and also in color. And here's an example of one of the Giza tombs on the west side of the Great Pyramid. Spectacular rendering. Now, you may be wondering, how is this useful? Doesn't scholarship progress? And here we are in 2016 and beyond. And this is a drawing from the 1840s. Why would this be useful for scholarship? Well, think for a moment about the ravages of time. If you went to Giza today, you would not see the details on the wall that you see in this rendering. The colors are gone, perhaps there's been some damage over time, the elements, perhaps even vandalism. You will not see the details today that you can study in this drawing. And so when we study the Giza necropolis, we go as far back as we possibly can in terms of documentation. Every little bit helps. Drawings, notes, diary entries, photographs. Very often we can study Giza better in these old archives than we could standing in front of the monuments today. After Lepsius, we have another milestone in the founding of the Egyptian Antiquity Service and the first Egyptian museum. This we owe to Auguste Mariette, a Frenchman who took care of all of the monuments, tried to regulate excavations, and Mariette was also active at Giza for a time as well. It was 1858 that the Antiquity Service was founded. Here in this photograph, the arrow is pointing to the Khafre Valley Temple, and here, Mariette did some clearance excavations and found one of the greatest statues ever discovered, not only at Giza, but anywhere in Egypt. Here you can see a view of the beautiful granite square pillars. These were excavated at the granite quarries in Aswan and brought by barge hundreds of miles northwards to Giza. And then in the middle of the picture, you see those little emplacements, the depressions in the floor. They've been partially restored in modern times, but they were once lined with a series of statues. And the best one was the one that Mariette found and is now in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Here's a shot of it. It's in a material called anorthosite gneiss. It comes from a quarry hundreds of miles south of Giza and is difficult to photograph. You can see all the different colors and veins shining through. But like the famous pear statue of Menkaure and his queen, this shows the ageless, idealized, physically perfect god king ruling over a centralized kingdom. The next famous person to visit the site was in the 1880s. This is Flinders Petrie, perhaps the father of modern scientific archaeology, followed only by our own George Reisner. Petrie originally got interested in all the mystical measurements and mathematical calculations about the pyramids, and he wanted to check it out for himself. So he came here to Giza, and on the east side of the Great Pyramid, he made up shop in a tiny little rock-cut tomb and lived there for a while, and did some of the best and most accurate measurements of the entire site. 
I've found this tomb actually in later years and asked my Egyptian inspector to pose in the same stance right in front of it. So you can see that not too much has changed in all the intervening decades. And now we come to the big three. So the year was around 1902, 1903. George Reisner was excavating at other sites and there was plundering and illicit digging going on at Giza. And in fact, there were Englishmen and others who were working at the site without a lot of archeological training and experience. This was driving the Egyptologists and the archeologists crazy. So Reisner and others appealed to the antiquities authorities, then under French control, under a man named Gaston Maspero, and eventually, the decision was made to let scientific expeditions come to Giza and dig the site responsibly. There was an American mission interested under George Reisner. There was a German mission interested under Georg Steindorf. And the Italians from Turin were represented by Ernesto Schiaparelli. They were all told to meet amicably and divide the site of the pyramids amongst themselves. And that's what they did. They met on the veranda of the famous Mina House Hotel and they drew lots out of Mary Reisner's hat and divided up the pyramids and the mastaba fields surrounding them. In this image, you can see the division of the site as it was originally made and then as it changed over time. The yellow shaded area was given to George Reisner and the Americans. That's the western side of the Great Pyramid, the northernmost strip of the Western Cemetery. The blue area was given to the German expedition. That's the central strip of the Western Cemetery and also the second pyramid. And then the orange colored area was given to the Italians, to Schiaparelli. That's the entire eastern field and also the southern strip of the Western Cemetery. Well, the Italians only stayed a few seasons and then they wanted to go off digging elsewhere. And so George Reisner actually inherited the Italian concession. So he now had two thirds of the Western Cemetery, all of the Eastern Cemetery, the third pyramid of Menkaure, and the Germans retained the area that they had. Much later, when World War II broke out and the Germans were not allowed to continue excavating, an Egyptian mission took over part of the German, by then German-Austrian, concession. And in the lower part of the photograph, the area shaded in green, that became the Egyptian concession. That's the so-called central field, west or behind the Sphinx. Here's an overview plan that's colorized just to show how complicated the excavation history of Giza is. And this plan is only of the Western Cemetery, west of Khufu's Pyramid. All the different colors represent the American, the German, Austrian, and later on Egyptian excavations that were busy here. Reisner set up shop west of the Great Pyramid in a collection of mud brick huts known as Harvard Camp. And this was his home basically for the next 40 years. He owned no property back in the United States and he only returned about four or five times to teach at Harvard University and to be curator at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. So even when he dug at other sites up the Nile and in the Sudan, Harvard camp at Giza remained headquarters. And by about the 1930s, it was quite a complex. You can see in this overview photograph how it had grown. There was the director's house, the office, kitchens, bedrooms, a lower house for uh, expedition staff, uh, photographic development studio. There was even a tennis court, although Reisner's health precluded him from playing tennis by that time. Here is a photograph of the original part of the German concession. These tombs get a D number to them, and you can see the new limestone blocks. The Egyptians have restored them in recent years, and they're in great condition. So this is the far western cemetery. But an interesting thing happened years later. By 1912, Georg Steindorf was interested in working in Nubia. Another Egyptologist from Germany, Hermann Juncker, was working in Nubia, and he was interested in working at Giza. So they met in the Hildesheim Museum at the opening of the new museum. This was 1911. And they decided to change and swap concessions. So Juncker came to Giza and Steindorf went elsewhere. This is how the German concession became the German-Austrian concession because Juncker was then professor at the University of Vienna. So here is a famous photograph of a gathering in 1935 of a lot of the top guns of Egyptology. On the left, we see Hermann Juncker with the pipe next to him and the glasses is an aging George Reisner. To his left is James Henry Breasted, the other great American Egyptologist who founded the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. And on the far right is Ludwig Borchardt, a good friend of Reisner from his training days in Berlin and a specialist in the architecture of ancient Egyptian monuments. 
The three of them met in 1935 in the Hotel Continental in Cairo, and actually some of them had had some bad blood, so this was kind of a reconciliation luncheon, and they all parted company in good spirits. Unfortunately, Breasted got on the boat for America the next morning and got sick and had died by the time the boat reached New York. Here is a photograph of Junker's expedition working in the Western Cemetery. Remember, these were the days of 75, 100, 150 workmen moving huge mounds of earth in railroad cars and tracks and dumping them off the end of the site. And this is Salim Hassan standing next to George Reisner. Salim Hassan led the Egyptian expedition that took over the central field when the Germans were no longer able to work there. The photograph here, taken from the top of the Great Pyramid, shows how extensive and complex the central field is. The pathway of limestone running from right to left in the center part of the photograph is the causeway that connects Khafre's Valley Temple to his Pyramid Temple and Pyramid. And then at the top of the photograph, what you see is a modern Muslim and Christian cemetery and the so-called Southern Mount at the very top of the photograph behind.